Hi, welcome to Richard Bay Talk. I'm Richard Bay, of course, and I'm here with producer Albert Reynoso, who has shaved his head and uh, I think in solidarity with the prisoners in the gulag. You look like you're like you're you like prison. That's what? a better that's better than what I've been called in the last couple of days after I got my hair cut. <laughs> that's Didn't a pretty that's a haircut. They didn't leave a hair. <laughs> well, you know, I got I got a discount. I got instead of seventeen dollars, I got the coupon, and it was only nine. <laughs> this is what I came out with. All right, Albert, get yeah. out the popcorn here. <laughs> okay. Get out the inflationary overpriced. I can't believe it's not butter there because the show has begun. It's not even primary season, and already. Uh, the Republican pundits and uh, would-be candidates are like scorpions in a bottle, uh, which means that they're capable of killing each other, but at risk of their own political life. Now, scorpions in a bottle is a phrase that was first coined by Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes to talk about uh, the disparate justices on the Supreme Court. But man, this is some show it's not even primary season yet. And look what's happened in the last week. First of all, well, just because we're covering it first, uh, Carrie Lake shared a tweet with the title, The Kiss of Death, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis Endorsed by George Soros. There you go. The, could you believe that? George Soros endorsed Ron DeSantis? Well, that's what Carrie Lake believes. Um, and Trump has called DeSantis a rhino globalist. Um, and then after that, there was more of George Santos. Uh, George Santos. Yes, George DeSantos. <laughs> now they've become one. All right, there he is. Oh, my God. That is Ron DeSantis, a uh, campaign aide. Oh, snuggling up to George Soros. Uh, and Roger Stone tweeted this, Ron DeSantis' Ukrainian handler and her real boss. Oh, she's not working for DeSantis. She's working for George Soros, the globalist who has his fingers in everything around the world. Uh, well, that's th that woman is um, uh, Pushaw. She was his... Uh, a PR person. She's working on his campaign. She's not Ukrainian, but they did catch her as a foreign agent. And while she was working for DeSantis, she was also working for the president of the former Soviet um, state of Georgia, the former president of the former state. So she had to register as a foreign agent, but no, she is uh, not Ukrainian. And she is, and that picture is obviously photoshopped. I mean, if you look at it, but that's that's Roger Stone uh, commenting now. Now, she is despicable in her own right. She was the one who announced that uh, anyone who opposes the DeSantis don't say gay bill is a groomer or is sympathizing with groomers, which led to DeSantis demonstrators going to Disney World and posting vile things like this. Can we see that next pic, please? There you go. Pedo World instead of Disney World Resort. And some of the things they were saying were just, you know, ludicrous. And by the way, because the CEO of, um, of, of Disney at the time said that he opposed the don't say gay bill, um, DeSantis has revoked the privileges they had for 50 years. DeSantis is now installing five overseers who will have to okay every kind of improvement or building or addition that Disney World uh, wants to pursue. All right. That's, that's real free market uh, economy right there. And sure, I'm sure Disney uh, looking at five people who will now control how they expand Disney World, all appointed by DeSantis. I'm sure that won't have a chilling effect 
on their freedom of speech as a corporation, because we know corporations are people and they have the, the they have the right to uh, give money to candidates. All right. Now, maybe you're wondering, what exactly did George Soros say? He couldn't have come out and just said, I like Ron DeSantis. I want him to be the next president. This is what George Soros did say. My hope for 2024 is that Trump and Governor DeSantis of Florida will slug it out for the Republican nomination. Trump has turned into a pitiful figure, continually bemoaning his loss in 2020. Big Republican donors are abandoning him in droves. DeSantis is shrewd, ruthless, and ambitious. He is likely to be a Republican candidate. This could induce Trump, whose narcissism has turned into a disease, to run as a third party candidate. That would uh, lead to a Democratic landslide and force the Republican Party to reform itself. But perhaps I may be just a little bit biased. <laughs> That's hardly a, a ringing endorsement, shrewd, ruthless, ambitious. Uh, and actually, he sees that as part of a plan to bring the Democrats to power. But, you know, that doesn't stop Carrie Lake or Roger Stone, um, who never ran into a fact or the truth that they didn't run away from. All right. There was also another entry, an official entry this time into the race for president, and that was Nikki Haley. Um, uh, she was the former UN ambassador under Donald Trump. She was also um, the governor of South Carolina. And she is also, as she never lets you forget, the proud daughter of immigrants from India. So Ann Coulter, boy, where has she been? Could you believe that Ann Coulter used to date Bill Maher? Wow. I don't know who I feel worse for. <laughs> That's hard. It's hard to imagine. Anyway, Ann Coulter is back. And uh, as anorexic as ever, she was on uh, the Mark Simone radio show in New York. Mark Simone was uh, someone that I worked with when I was on radio. And he is currently on one of the leading uh, right-wing talk stations in New York. She called Nikki Haley a bimbo a preposterous creature. And then to top it all off, she said, go back to your own country where the people are starving because they won't touch cows and they build temples to worship rats. No, they really do. They worship rats in India. Go back to your own country. <laughs> Remember when Trump said that to uh, Ilan Omar? <laughs> go back to your own country. Yeah, proud immigrant. So Nikki Haley, a lot of people see her as sort of, you know, a mo more moderate than maybe DeSantis or, or Donald Trump. And specifically because while she was governor in South Carolina, she ordered uh, that they take down the Confederate flag. But before you go rushing to moderate Nikki Haley, uh, she did go to a Confederate Memorial Association. And she was asked about secession and whether states have the right to secede from the union. This is what she said. Do you believe the states of the United States have the right to secede from the union? I think that they do. I mean, the Constitution. If it became an issue where the South, state of South Carolina needed to secede from the union, would you support it? You know, I'm one of those people that doesn't think it's going to get to that point. All right. She doesn't think it's going to get to that point, but she thinks it's in the Constitution. I'd like to know where. Uh, and actually, the Supreme Court had a decision, Texas versus White, where they said it is specifically not 
in the Constitution. And it said the Confederate States, this was Salmon P. Chase, who was the, um, uh, the uh, 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 chief justice who wrote the majority opinion. The states of the Confederacy, they never even left the Union during the Civil War because a state cannot unilaterally secede. It's an indissoluble relation. Um, the act which consummated a state's admission into the Union was something more than a compact. It was the incorporation of a new member into the political body, and it was final. So Nikki Haley, uh, maybe you found this clause in the Constitution that guaranteed state secession in the same place where Donald Trump found that clause in the Constitution that he vowed to defend forever a clause that didn't exist, if you remember that. So all of these people talk about the Constitution. They don't know too much about it. Um, and then there is Donald Trump, who has fortunately told us he's not going to call Ron DeSantis meatball Ron out of respect for his Italian heritage. Uh, he has called him uh, Ron Sanctimonious after... Uh, Ron DeSantis put out a video saying that God, after creating light in the earth and the waters and Adam and Eve and the creatures, he created Ron DeSantis on the eighth day to be God's warrior. Yeah. Remember that commercial? <laughs> we aired it here on one of the Richard Bay talks. So he called him uh, Rob, uh, Ron Sanctimonious. And he has also called him a fat fraud whiner. And he's called him a rhino globalist, I guess, uh, in connection with his, um, you know, his minions connecting Ron DeSantis to George Soros, which is complete bullshit, of course. Uh, but uh, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Uh, he's also called him a groomer. You know, uh, Ron DeSantis said, if you oppose his his don't say gay bill, you're a groomer or a groomer synthesizer, uh, sympathizer. Trump said, went even further than that. He said Ron DeSantis was a groomer because when he was a high school teacher, he was partying and drinking alcohol with high school girls. And he posted a picture to prove it. And then Ron DeSantis, oh, that's <laughs> Ron DeSantis, there he is. You know, he's now banning books, but there's one book that I'm sure he did ban. And that's the book he's reading to this little guy who looked, sounds so interested. Yes, it's Trump, the art of the deal. I'm sure this little guy is going, wah, wah, daddy, you're not only banning books in school, you took away my Trump book. Why don't you read it to me anymore? I'm sure that doesn't happen. Now, in Florida here, uh, as we spoke about last week, uh, there is now some kind of a media consultant that has to review every book. And some books that uh, deal with racism have been pulled from the libraries. But there was one teacher in Duval County uh, who went into the library, filmed what he saw, empty shelves in a library. And you can tell it is a library. It still has the you know, the, the, the alphabetical Dewey Decimal things over them. And then there's little exhibits that the children created. And he posted that on the internet. Um, here's his video of the empty bookshelves. Uh, so what happened after he posted that video? Well, that teacher was fired the next day. He said there was no communication from the district or anything about what I was doing. Nobody told me not to take a video in the library until DeSantis was asked the question in a press conference, and he blew up. He said it was uh, a phony uh, allegation, and that the teachers were behind it. 
that they were trying to make him look bad. Now, Albert, you don't believe the video is real, right? I don't believe the video relates to books being removed because they have to be um, checked or whatever, whatever the reason was. It looks too empty. The, the library looks uh, like it's been worked over. There's stuff on the, on the counters that don't look right. I, I'm not buying it. I, okay. I, I don't like so what it. Do you, so I what do you think happened video. to the books? They just walked I, I, out? I don't know, but I, I, but I'd like, I'd like to think that there's something was going on with the library. They're redoing something because you don't take every book out for that reason. Well, that maybe, maybe the students at this school are such voracious readers that they have taken out every book home so they can read them. Maybe let's that's so. the explanation. Let's hope so. And anyway. you know what? Kids, kids are going to find the information anyway, because they have iPads and they have phones. Book banning doesn't exist anymore. It's not going to happen. Okay. All right. I don't think. All right. You don't think, well, I don't know. It remains to be seen. All right, so now we're seeing, uh, oh, what is it? A whole bunch of Republican states are banning drag shows uh, or actually turning them into um, adult, uh, verifying them for zoning as adult places of business, which will restrict where you can have a, 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 a drag show or might even probably would keep, you know, drag queens from marching in a gay pride parade because it's out in public. Um, so this is going on in multiple Republican states. Uh, the accusations that uh, drag queens are out there grooming children, I don't know for what, what to grow up and become drag queens. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna have a generation of, not only that, things like drag queen reading hour, are voluntary. Nobody makes your little Tommy and little Susie go to a drag queen reading hour. These There's are no parents books for them to read to anyway, because they're off the shelves. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, when I think maybe you remember Lee Atwater, he was a Republican consultant who told who talked about the progression of right wing racism. Over the years, he was a, a guy, I, I believe he was uh, in the George Bush campaign when they came out with that Willie Horton ad to frighten people about uh, dangerous black men. Um, he was recorded as saying, you start out in 1954 by saying N-word, N-word, N-word. He actually used the word I can't under our uh, our, our current uh, climate. Frankly, I think when you quote somebody to show how despicable you are, you should be able to say the word. It, it always bums me out when, not bums me out, it seems anachronistic when I see a movie set during the antebellum South uh, when there was slavery and the people talk about, they never use the word now. Um, and uh, <laughs> You know they did. Or even during the Jim Crow era. You know they did. And by crossing it out, I think you delete some of the despicable horror and dehumanization that occurred towards African Americans during that period of time. That's just my opinion. Anyway, he says, in 1968, we got to the point you can't say the N-word. And that hurts you, it backfires. So you stay, so you say stuff like, well, forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. And you're getting kind of abstract. Now you're talking about cutting taxes, and they're totally economic things. And a byproduct of them is that blacks will get hurt worse than whites. It's a hell of a lot more abstract then N-word, N-word, N-word. And what he's saying is basically, it's the same impetus. It's just a, for, a different form of political expression. And I think the same is happening with gay rights and creating gays as the other. Children can't hear that some kids in the class may have two daddies or two mommies you can't bake a cake for a gay wedding back in the old days 
you didn't have to skirt around the issue. You could go right to the core of it. And one of the people who did was Pat Buchanan, a, a man who ran for president and, you know, got to address the Republican convention. I had the opportunity to debate him about uh, gay Americans on my talk show. Uh, he retired this week, actually. Uh, but here's that uh, part of that debate. Quote here that you called homosexuality an unnatural and unsanitary act. That's right. The mayor of New York has called you a homophobe in the past. Yeah. Um, and there have been some articles that I've read where you have, if not come right out and said it, but there was the insinuation that homosexuals were responsible for the AIDS epidemic. Every great religion has taught it is wrong. Who, who are you quoting when you say it is right? I am not, I'm not being judgmental about it. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm saying that I don't want somebody opening up, I don't want somebody opening my door and coming into my bedroom and saying, that's the wrong position. Would you please do it another way? <laughs> Nobody, and Richard. If Richard, I want that freedom, I am willing to afford it to Richard, other individuals. Let me con All right, that was Patrick Buchanan. And in the days when people spoke their mind about gay rights, in the days when people were saying that gays were the ones who were spreading the AIDS epidemic and killing Americans, that they were dangerous. Oh, by the way, that Lee Atwater quote about the subtlety of modern racism, it was discovered by a young researcher called James Carter IV. That's right, Jimmy Carter's grandson. And this week we heard the sad news that Jimmy Carter has um, requested that he spend his last days, he's 98 years old, at home in hospice care. And uh, when you think back on Jimmy Carter, it, it's arguable both ways, whether he was a good president or whether he was not sufficient to the times. But boy, he was handed, he was handed a bad hand. He, he had the Iranian hostage crisis, which was on nightline every night, reminding people. He had Operation Eagle Claw, which um, failed in the desert. Eight American servicemen were killed. Um, but Jimmy Carter was no more responsible for the bad weather and the malfunctioning helicopter in that attempt to rescue the hostages than Ronald Reagan was for the O-rings that came apart on the Challenger and blew up, killing the astronauts that were on it. There was runaway inflation that he inherited, but he's the person that appointed Paul Volcker, the big guy. Paul Volcker was six foot seven. Do you know that? Anyway, he's the guy that took pretty draconian measures to tame inflation so that when Ronald Reagan was president, by the time he ran for uh, his second term in 84, impla inflation had been relatively tamed. So uh, Jimmy Carter, in my opinion, is one of the two good men that have been president. And I mean, not good presidents, but really good men, exemplary human beings that have been in the White House. Barack Obama and Jimmy Carter, both of them are two of the four presidents who received the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, I had the, the great privilege to interview Jimmy Carter, and afterwards, the th people always say, well, what surprised you? He has a great sense of humor. And he was so gracious and upbeat and content and generous. He took this picture with me and my parents after the interview. There they are. Uh, and my mother ran up and she said, Mr. Carter, Mr. Carter, take a picture with me. I'm a Democrat, but my husband's a Republican. And that's, that's someone that looked somewhat like me in years past on the end there. Anyway, uh, I had a clip previously on the Richard Bay talk that uh, that concerned Jimmy Carter when he was talking about policy, principally uh, the Camp David Accords, which is probably his shining, shining achievement, and the foundation for Israel's security, at least with uh, the Arab states that surround it. But 
this week, I'd like to show you some part of that interview that reveals more of Jimmy Carter, the man. A man, I think, was a good man. Take a look at this. This is the Emmy Award winning People Are Talking. Please welcome former president Jimmy Carter. Good morning. great privilege for us to have you here today. Welcome to Pennsylvania, the Delaware Valley, and Philadelphia. Well, I'm glad to be by. Thank you. You know, the presidency, you have had a few years to think about it. You have been busy. You've been writing some books. You have been doing other things. You've been teaching. Do you miss the presidency, though? Not really. I, I remind myself that even if I had been elected to a second term, I would now be out of office and someone else would be there. Obviously, I wanted to be... Uh, there for eight years. I think I could have done a lot more for peace and human rights and, and uh, arms control had I stayed there. But I've had a very full life and a very enjoyable and exciting and challenging life since I left the White House. So, so there is life after public office, I'm glad to announce. And our family have uh, both enjoyed the four years in the White House and also the four years since then. Is it tough on the family, though? When you become president, your family, in a way, accepts an added responsibility. They are under the scrutiny of the press. Everything they say and do is interpreted by the mass media. Is that a little rough on them? So I think it's kind of a voluntary thing. Our family found that the four years in the White House, though, um, and the campaign ahead of time to get there, really kind of uh, solidified our family as a unit. unit. It was kind of like a basketball team working in different courts all over the <laughs> nation simultaneously. We have very strong ties to Plains, Georgia. Both Rosen's family and my family, members who were born in the 1700s, are buried there in Plains. So we haven't gone very far, as you can see. And we tried to be home at least one day a week on the weekend to go to church, to talk to each other, to share, compare notes, to plan for the next week, and then go out again and come back. So it was uh, a very exciting, challenging, gratifying thing. And my overall impression is one of gratitude to the American people for making it possible for us. One of the key players on that basketball team was your wife, Rosalind. She was number one. <laughs> she was the number one player. She was also our guest on People Are Talking last year oh. here on the show. There has, she's been in the news recently because there has been talk that she might pursue a political career. Principally, the speculation has been that she might run for governor of Georgia. Is that a future possibility that Rosalind might enter the world of politics? I think it would be highly unlikely. Uh, we have a governor in Georgia now, a Democrat, who's uh, doing a good job. I don't have any idea that she would run against him. Uh, after four more years, it's a possibility, but unlikely. Uh, some speculation has been that Rosen would run for the U.S. Senate, but I think this would split up our marriage after 38 years. I don't think we'll do that because I'm not, I'm not going up to uh, Washington to spend six years you know, as a spouse of a U.S. Senator. <laughs> Has been quoted as saying, though, that she is even more political than you are. Yes, there's no doubt about that. What does that mean? I think, well, we had several arguments while I was president that lasted a long time, and uh, each one of them, about the things that I did that were highly controversial and quite often not politically popular. Rosen thought that most of those things should have been postponed to a second term, and that I should have been more, much more careful about getting embroiled in controversial issues. But I, I would tell Rosalind, uh, you know, I didn't come here just to be reelected. I came here to, to do what I think was best for my country. So I think that Rosen has much more sensitive antenna than I do about what cost me votes. Uh, and uh, she knows this country, and she understands the theory and the practical application of politics as well as anyone I've ever known. He's been married to Rosalind longer than I've been alive. He, they've been over 75 years they've been man and wife. And he has scores of grandchildren. And like Cincinnatus in the Roman Empire, like George Washington, and like uh, 
well, to some degree, uh, uh, Harry Truman. He didn't go out and try to pursue more power after he was president, not like Donald Trump, who keeps coming back. No, he went home to the farm. He did good works. He spent time with his family. And he has said in the past, I've had a good life. So let me leave you with these words about what was important to Jimmy Carter. Can we see that last pic, please? Earlier in my life, I thought the things that mattered were the things that you could see, like your car, your house, your wealth, your property, your office. But as I've grown older, I've become convinced that the things that matter most are the things that you can't see, the love you share with others, your inner purpose, your comfort with who you are. Great words from a, what I think is a great man. And we wish him and his family all the best. So I, I, I'm going to be gone for a few weeks. I'm going to New York. So this will be the last podcast for a little while. We'll come back in March. Thanks for letting me know. I'm letting you know now. I didn't know <laughs> right. Well, good. I hope you're I'll right. miss you. But do you want to have a Hash Wednesday tomorrow? Whatever you like. It's Ash Wednesday. It would, so be, we it would go... be two days from now, not tomorrow. Oh, yeah, Wednesday. Right, right. right. Well, we could have a Hash Wednesday. It would be a joy to see you again. <laughs> Maybe you can recommend your barber to me. Anyway, uh, remember, please, thank you for watching. Uh, subscribe to the channel, to the podcast. You'll never miss one. And from all of us here to all of you out there, all our best. Take care. <laughs>